Almost 2,000 people have died, including 10 doctors and over 20 nurses. So we, as Sierra Leoneans, I'm representing the United States Sierra Leonean Association, which is stationed in Staten Island. Um, we're asking you all to help us find a way. Either whatever way we find, we depend on you people, and we expect good results to come after. We have a non-profit organization based in Staten Island, and we're not just sitting down waiting for people to come help us. We've been trying to help ourselves. It's the disease is not just the Ebola that is killing the people in Sierra Leone or in West Africa. It's hunger. Because when they suspect that you have the virus, the, the, the present position right now is when you have fever, you have anything that is part of the symptoms of Ebola, they're going to quarantine you. Whether it's Ebola or not, they put you somewhere. And when they put that mixture of those who have Ebola and those who don't have Ebola, then you end up catching Ebola. Now it's hunger that is killing them. Because when they put you somewhere, you cannot come outside and there is not enough food to feed you. The next thing you do is you get sick and you die. <laughs> oh, sisters and brothers, you, I hope you don't mind if I call you sisters and brothers. I'm, I'm from the Union world and in, in Africa, we are all sisters and brothers. So it makes it a, a, a stronger uh, look and I believe that we're in a village. I want to thank Mr. Saidu from the uh, Union of the Sierra Leone Association in, America, in Staten Island for that wonderful talk and I hope that you take note and after the program you can speak to him about further information on what they're doing. At this time, we're going to move on to the program, and uh, I'm going to introduce to you a dynamic speaker from the National Board Veterans for Peace, uh, the director of the Urban Issues Institute, SSCCC. Uh, this person, I believe, they say she's going to wake us up from our sleep, so I, uh, I hope you're ready for her. Uh, please welcome Dr. Margaret Stevens. On in September, I took a trip to um, Washington, D.C. with Michael Gray, who uh, is head of foreign relations for Congressman Payne's office in New Jersey. Michael Gray is um, a librarian. He's also an advocate for his community. I'm sure many people here are familiar with him from the Liberian community. So we took a trip to D.C. with a group of Sierra Leoneans and um, Guineans, and um, uh, we met. Uh, we had a couple Congress people speak. And then there was a man from the USAID who spoke as well. And I just want to, what happened is that briefly he spoke about, um, this was all about the Ebola outbreak, and, uh, and the, the, the man from the USAID was so proud to announce the fact that he had just heard that uh, USAID was going to offer 400 beds for the people of Liberia for the Ebola outbreak, and that 100 beds were going to be placed in four separate soccer arenas and that these 100 beds were really going to help do something about the outbreak. And on top of the 100 beds, he had 200,000 home protection kits that the people would have so that they could help care for their family members who were getting sick. And a home protection kit is latex gloves and like a little vest or like a little, um, you know, plastic apron. Coming from the U.S. Right. This is the same country that can afford to send people to explore stuff far away in outer space, not on the planet. Right. This is the same country that has billions of dollars to build new 9-11 buildings in 10 years. This is the same United States. Right. But they were so proud to announce these 400 beds and these protection kits in soccer arenas in a country where a soccer arena is not like the it's not like the Madison Square Gardens right so the fact that this was the best he could come up with and he was proud to announce this and the fact that this is the same USAID that's basically a humanitarian arm of the United States military which basically means they go into many of the regions of the world where the United States has strategic interests and then they do good deeds for the local people and basically help 
implement United States military infrastructure wherever they go. So whether it's Central America, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's Africa, the United U.S. aid is just a certain form of U.S. military expansion and intervention around the world. So they come bragging about what they're going to do in a group like this full of African people back in September. So that shows you the negligence that we're talking about. And it's not like this negligence is just by mistake, right? This negligence is is representation of the fact that Africa for the past 500 years has been nothing more for the ruling classes of this world as a resource for labor. It's been nothing more than a site of extracting mass wealth, whether it's the diamonds, whether it's the rubber, whether it's you know the gold, whatever resources they have, and the humans have only been a means of extracting that labor. And so that's where this systematic negligence comes from. It doesn't just happen because of bad leaders. It's not just because President Obama doesn't care. So we need to be very clear as to why the United States can be so cavalier about the deaths of these people. And you know, from the political economic perspective, you know, when we think about Africa, we ha what we have to also understand at this moment in history is that not only is Africa, you know, a strategic point for the expansion of capitalism for countries like China, who see Africa as a very important pool of labor and also sites where they can set up their own infrastructures and factories and plants to extract resources from Africa, but as workers from different populations around the world no longer become the, 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 the choice of industrialists to expand, right now it's China, there are new sites where human labor can be extrapolated from. And in many ways, Africa continues, in my opinion, as far as I see it, to be a reserve army of humans who this racist system around the world has always seen as a site where maybe we'll expand there 50, 20, 30 years down the line. Maybe that'll be an important military strategic location if we want to bomb the Middle East or bomb other parts of the world. So when we talk about trying to do something about Ebola, we have to understand that as humans and as people who care about people people all over the world, we're doing this not just because we feel bad, not just because what's happening is inhumane, but because it's not a sustainable way to organize our human society to allow millions of people in parts around the world to just go extinct. It's not a sustainable form of human existence, but it is the form of existence that's winning right now. So what they're not telling us is that many of the people who are going out to West Africa are from Cuba, right? The socialist countries, those are the people sending their doctors out there to do something about this. Doctors Without Borders, which comes from mainly, you know, Western capitalist countries, they also do a really great job as much as they can, but they're underfunded, they're understaffed, they don't get the resources they need. So, I mean, I'm pretty sure you can get my point, and my point is that we live in a world where human life is not the paramount goal, it's not the paramount value, it's wealth and it's profit that's the paramount value. And when we live in a world like that, well, the Mike Browns of the world will continue to be hung, right? They lynched us 100 years ago and they continue to lynch us today because that's the nature of this unequal society that we live in here. There are many people who aren't necessary in this country that we live in right here. So there are parallels between the needless deaths of people in West Africa from a virus that can be contained. And I agree with you that the infrastructure is poor. When he says that the infrastructure is poor just from another word, what that means is that if you get a shipment of supplies that just came from the Red Cross and it comes to the port of Liberia, the problem is how are you going to get those goods to the inner central districts of some of these cities where the roads are so damaged that getting the goods there is a problem? How the infrastructure is so damaged that there's no surveillance so that by the time you try to get the goods to the villages where the people are suffering, 90% of those resources have been stolen by the wealthy who took the best supplies to fund their private clinics. So even though those resources were supposed to go to the poor, they don't make it to the poor. And I know this not just from making this up, I was in Haiti. 
And I saw this happen after the earthquake, when all the hospital workers in Haiti were like, you're leaving us with nothing. People are dying from this earthquake, and we can't even provide for them as nurses and doctors because all of the stuff that's being donated to us is being stolen by the wealthy for their private clinics. So it's not just Haiti. It's not just West Africa. It's also the Philippines. My student here from the Philippines who's, you know, I know people who lost family members because of the typhoon that hit several years ago. People who live on shores by beaches because that's the least valuable land so they don't live far enough away from the shore. So when the oceans and the waves come, they destroy everybody who lives two miles from the shore. That's systematic gross negligence of human life all over the world. So I see that my time is up. I came all the way here from New Jersey. We got in the car at 3.30 in the afternoon. But the point is that, you know, you've really got to understand that when you want to allow for the type of theoretical organizing that's necessary to take this stuff to the next level, you know, you have to provide the spaces where that people can lay this stuff out and you can leave with concrete actions. So for example, one of the concrete things that we're doing at Essex County College is a group of us is supposed to be um, doing some radio um, lesson plans for many of the students in some of these countries um, where the colleges have shut down, they've stopped teaching because of the outbreak. So what uh, we heard that what they're doing in um, Africa to carry on the lesson plans is they're using the radio. So people are staying in their homes and the students are trying to learn by listening to the radio. So a group of us were thinking if we create lesson plans and then deliver them you know, over the radio airwaves, then they can still continue to receive some education you know, without having to leave their homes. So we have to figure out creative ways like that to turn a negative into a positive. But as long as we continue to buy into this idea that that's your country, your country, that's your hood, this is my hood, this is my country, those are my people, when the, the diseases don't respect the borders. We're the only ones that respect the borders and the borders don't help us. They only help the wealthy. So until we start to think in a more sophisticated manner than the people with more power than us, we really won't win. So we've got to take that type of approach very seriously, and I'm happy that you brought me here today to make that point. Our next speaker is from a coalition that has done a lot of work over the years around another epidemic, um, and that would be the, uh, the AIDS epidemic and um, you know, has, has stepped up again for this issue. So please welcome Marcelo Maya from ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power in New York. When Ebola uh, surfaced and we saw the reaction from, mainly from politicians here in the United States, uh, we immediately made the connection on how these politicians react when AIDS or HIV surfaced here. The, the fear-based politics, the um, stigma that start being generated in, uh, around Ebola was so closely uh, associated with HIV that affected us immediately. So uh, we created a group on ECTAP to deal specifically with Ebola, and it's like a, a think tank, and has uh, people from different organizations, including Medicine Sans Frontier and uh, treatment action groups and, and, and people from ACTAP too. The, the, uh, I really like what you said about Ebola affecting the other. It's not just the other, it's in another country, in another hemisphere, uh, in, in another continent. So uh, this idea of the other, we are all others. We are others for the person next to us. So the idea that it's something that's not going to affect us is a really wrong idea. Um, but it became kind of difficult to uh, f realize how we're going to respond to this. For instance, when uh, politicians in the early 90s, like Jesse Helms, start uh, spreading homophobic messages and trying to cut money to uh, HIV prevention and care and treatment. ACTAP uh, put a group together and traveled to Arlington where Jesse Helms had a house and we dressed his house with a huge condom 
The whole house was covered with a condom. It was visually a very strong message and very effective way of uh, carrying on a protest. What we do with Ebola, when the same thing here happened, when Governor Cuomo and Governor Christie, just before the elections, and because this was a popular measure, they decided to uh, impose a mandatory quarantine for people who are going to Africa to West Africa as volunteers to try to help people there. This, this created a reaction act up that we, we, we saw that we had to act immediately. At that time, Dr. Spencer had just been admitted to Bellevue Hospital and we had our first demonstration there. Around 60 people came and we uh, had people speaking in front of Bellevue in support of the healthcare professionals which were being stigmatized, and of course also the people from these countries which uh, were dealing directly with the problem. We marched from Bellevue to the governor's office. Um, it becomes now a, a problem how to follow up, how to continue with demonstrations to keep this issue up, because another thing that's happening Ebola seems to be not a problem anymore. It's not on the news anymore. It's, again, a problem that is affecting somebody else. It's not our problem. Uh, the way of uh, combating this is to really disseminating information. ECTAP has prepared a, 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 a fact sheet about Ebola. It's on the table on the back over there. It has our contact information, and we meet every Monday night at the LGBT Center. We've been meeting there since 1987. Um, we would like to invite all of you who would like to come to ECTAP, and uh, the ECTAP Ebola group meets uh, at 6 o'clock, just before our general meeting. Um, uh, my main interest in getting involved on this issue is really to combat the stigma. The stigma is, is, uh, feeds the epidemic. It fed the, the HIV epidemic and it still feeds it. Uh, the stigma caused uh, the United States to create a travel and immigration ban, which lasts for two decades. When this ban was created, there were like a few thousand cases of HIV and AIDS in the United States. When the ban was lifted, there was over a million cases. So it's a totally ineffective way of dealing with an epidemic. Fear is not going to stop anything. It's just, and, and, and when it's used for political purpose, uh, it, it really creates the politician, gives him an image of, I don't even know what to call it, uh, an opportunistic person. Uh, I think we should continue hammering both New Jersey governor and New York governor so they lift this mandatory uh, quarantine, which uh, we saw how the nurse in New Jersey and uh, how she was being treated, with, I mean, having to use a party. Uh, uh, I don't know uh, exactly, I mean, I don't think anybody has the answer. But we need, if you want to do anything, if you want to create change, you need to get together with a group, an organization that's working on this issue. And I'm sure that there are several around there that you can choose from and get involved and try to do something. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo. Um, as been mentioned and has been mentioned earlier, uh, some of the one of the countries providing the most support and aid for the Ebola crisis is Cuba, of course. And it is my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce Gail Walker from the Interreligious Foundation for Community Organizing, which routinely organizes um, solidarity delegations to Cuba. So, Gail Walker. Thank you, and thank you all for being here tonight. I keep looking up at this banner, Money for Ebola, Not Wars. Black Lives Matter, from West Africa to Staten Island to Ferguson. Says it all. Hi, Margaret. <laughs> um, 
you know, the outrage that has gripped this city and communities across the globe following the swath of killings of unarmed black men at the hands of racist police has underscored the message that black lives matter, and perhaps now more than ever. So as we all know, long before Amadou Diallo or Sean Bell or Oscar Grant, Trayvon Martin, Jordan Mar uh, Davis, Michael Brown, long before Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, long before Akai Gurley, there was Emmett Till and James Ch Cheney, and some of you might remember James Byrd, the black man who was chained to the back of a pickup truck and dragged for three miles to his death. We can't allow this to continue. And we're here to talk about the crisis that our brothers and sisters in Africa in particular are, are faced with at this point. But there's, there's a direct link and we can never forget that. Um, I'm excited to see the number of people who've been out on the streets night after night to really draw attention to this injustice. And we've got to continue to support them and especially the young people, the young activists who are making those kind of connections between the senseless murders and this continued racial profiling of our Muslim brothers and sisters and the tragic deaths of our African brothers and sisters from Ebola. So yes, my friends, black lives do matter. And we cannot allow our African family members to be stigmatized, as has been uh, stated, uh, by this deadly disease. Uh, but I want to just take a moment to talk a little bit about uh, Cuba. Um, it's been mentioned that Cuba has been on the, uh, uh, the front line, really, in this fight. And um, I think we have to take time to thank those who have been brave enough to run toward the fight, to run toward the fight while so many in the world are running from it. And, um, our Cuban comrades who have been on the front line in this uh, fight uh, really deserve um, praise. Despite the attempts by the mainstream media to uh, ignore Cuba's presence in West Africa, the world is watching, and uh, there's, mo there's no way, my friends, that, that, that Cuba can be ignored. It's been praised by the World Health Organization and the United Nations and even the U.S., um, the New York Times, who else, the U.S. UN Ambassador, um, Samantha Powers, has had to give credit to uh, the Cuban physicians fighting Ebola, the U.N. Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, and Secretary of State John Kerry, among the growing list of people who've been um, praising Cuba's efforts to fight Ebola. Uh, but that's, we, we don't need to hear their praise to really um, understand what Cuba has done for the world community, because this is not the first time that Cuba has been on the front lines. Uh, we know that fighting Ebola in West Africa is not the first example of Cuba's commitment to sharing in its expertise in social medicine. And the, the list is, goes on and on. But you know, Cuba has been in Nicaragua in the 70s, uh, in Honduras, in Guatemala, and Haiti following 1998's Hurricane Mitch and Hurricane Georges. Cuba provided long-term care for 18,000 victims of Chernobyl and um, offering treatment a variety of different uh, disorders connected with uh, radioactivity. The uh, 2004 Asian tsunami, Cuba was there. Hurricane uh, Katrina, Cuba tried to be there, but the U.S. government said no. Those same forces wound up in uh, Pakistan following uh, the earthquake there. So there's been countless, you know, examples of the way that Cuba has risen uh, to the uh, to the top in terms of providing its, its medical care. And of course, we can't forget the fact that Cuba continues to provide uh, uh, medical scholarships to thousands and thousands of people from uh, various countries, uh, free scholarships to uh, become physicians with the understanding that they'll return home and practice in underserved communities. To date, there have been more than 112 graduates from the US there's more than 107 currently practicing, and about 50 of them are in residency or practicing medicine. That's the kind of gift that Cuba has given. 
but it's that example, it's that, 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 that powerful uh, model that Cuba is uh, so known for and is providing um, on the ground in West Africa. Uh, so I just wanted to take a moment and really, there are plenty of other people who can speak to the, the, the details of uh, the impact that the Ebola crisis is having um, in West Africa. I wanted to make sure that we had some clarity and understanding about the role that um, our Cuban comrades have been playing uh, in, in this fight. These are just some of the examples of its commitment to the world despite being blockaded by the so-called most powerful nation in the world. Uh, so I want to just end by saying that not only will we continue to be in solidarity with the efforts in, uh, that Cuba is um, engaging in, not only will we continue to try to look at creative ways to really be supportive of the efforts to fight this, this deadly disease, but I want to take a page out of uh, Margaret, Dr. Margaret Stevens' book and, and, and ask and challenge us, how do we how do we get through? How do we, how do we rise above those, those obstacles? I know my time is up. I just want to say very quickly, if Go Pastors for Peace, we organize caravans of humanitarian aid. Many of you know this. We've done that in various parts of the world. Ironically, in the very uh, early 1970s, did a lot of that work um, in, in Africa. One of the challenges that we face as we think about how, do we be, how can we provide support for our, our brothers and sisters there is how do we get beyond that 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 the, the level of of um, help me with the word um, the, the the I'm just trying to the the, the not the vision, but you're saying that, that, that there's, there's really people on the ground that we can't actually reach out to, that we can't network with, that we can't work with because of the d dishonesty and the distrust and the, the corruption. Thank you. I don't know. You know, the graft, that. Thank you. See, Dr. Stevens has, has helped me tonight. That's what I, I, wanna, I want this to be in, in, uh, a learning lesson. How do we, we, we've got resources. We understand how to do caravans. We understand how to try to figure out ways to bring um, assistance and education to, to people here in the U.S. Uh, to help bring aid where it's, it's needed. But how do we get beyond that corruption and the, the, the graft that's on the ground in the country so that we can identify partners that we can actually partner with? That's the challenge that, you know, that frustrates me that frustrates us at IFCO as we think about, you know, how is it that we do take the resources that we here have um, in the United States to uh, bring to our brothers and sisters there. So I, I leave with that question and I look forward to talking to any of you around the edges um, uh, the rest of this evening about ways that we figure out how we, we get to the bottom of this. <laughs> Thank you. And I'd like to add, let's give it up for Cuba. Um, my proposal, Gil, is a citizen's movement from one person to another in those areas, trust the citizens. But anyway, I'm reminded of uh, this uh, prophetic word, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm, meaning that the Cubans are, do, are indeed prophets in the medical world, and we hope that we can acknowledge that. Uh, and we are also reminded about the words that Halle Selassie spoke and, uh, and uh, Bob Marley sang to until the day that the philosophy that holds one race superior and the other inferior is totally and permanently abandoned. Every day is going to be just not Ebola, but war and distinction. So let us be reminded of that. At this time, I'm not, I have the opportunity to introduce that he's from the People's Power Assembly. And he indeed, perhaps with the name the People's Power Assembly is a powerful boxer. So please welcome Mr. Larry Holmes. Uh, sisters and brothers, comrades and friends, I, I think Dr. Stevens made an analysis very briefly, but it was so true and you don't hear it. The fact of the matter is that black lives do not matter to imperialism. They do not matter to colonialism. It's not just stupidity or some subjective thing 
or individuals in hierarchical places. It's the fact that if the system cannot exploit some people, then their lives are expendable. Therefore, you have criminal neglect in relationship to Ebola. Therefore, the police can wage a lethal war against our black and brown youth because their lives are expendable because they can't be exploited to make the rich richer. It's one of the reasons why one of the slogans that I love in these demonstrations that have just flourished all over the country is uh, Eric Gardner, Michael Brown, tear the whole system down. It's funny how people's consciousness at a certain time people could just their consciousness seems paralyzed, seems stagnant. Some of us veterans of the struggle, we began to wonder, you know, why are the people not moving? You know, all these terrible things. And then all of a sudden, their consciousness just shoots up into the sky. And they, it's as though they've gotten a century worth of political consciousness in the course of a few days or a short period of time. Something is happening, sisters and brothers. There is a turning point here. People have been out in the streets every day for almost two weeks. First in reaction to the Ferguson grand jury. That was two weeks ago. And then in reaction to the Staten Island grand jury. Out in the streets in more than a hundred cities, in the thousands, blocking interstate highways, shutting down Amtrak trains, going into Grand Central Station, going to airports, going into Macy's, going into Apple stores and having die-ins, being out there at the Barclay Center last night with the royal couple and so forth, you know? Uh, hands up, don't shoot. I can't breathe in every part of the country. I can't remember when we've seen something like this. I mean, we don't want anyone to have to die, to have to be martyred. But I'll tell you something, Michael Brown and Eric Gardner, they did not die in vain. They did not die in vain. Because for some reason, after all the names that we can go down, John Bell, Ramali Graham, Amadou, for some reason, it took these two men, the lynching of these two men, for people to say, that's it. Enough is enough. All I want to just reinforce, and I'm speaking to soldiers here, I recognize many of you as being veterans in the struggle, is that we have an obligation now we have to support this uprising. That's really what it is. It's a nationwide uprising against this police war on young black and brown people. Not exclusively young black and brown people, but mostly. It's, it's an uprising. And we are obligated to find ways to support it. We can come together and talk about it at the People's Power Assembly. We'll be meeting tomorrow night at 7. It's on that slip of paper, 124 West 24th Street. We can come and talk about it. There'll be a lot of people there. A lot of the young people will be there. We've got the demonstrations that uh, 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 Lilani already announced. Uh, tomorrow, uh, 4 o'clock, 42 Vanderbilt, which is a, right next to Grand Central Station. Uh, that's where there'll be some bourgeois think, type, think tank seminar on, on uh, broken windows. And that's really, you know, what killed uh, Eric Gardner, you know, picking up people on these petty crimes and killing them, you know. The following day at one on Thursday, somebody is giving Police Commissioner Bratton an award. I mean, what is up with that? And that's at one o'clock, and that's actually on 14th Street and 5th Avenue, 85th Avenue. There's the big millions march for justice on Saturday, 2 p.m., Washington Square Park. Some of us 
are, are talking about targeting Martin Luther King's birthday, not the holiday, his actual birthday, January 15th, because that's a working day, that's a Thursday, as a day when we have a citywide strike, where we shut all shopping down, where we just shut the whole city down. Some of us need a little more time than some of the young people who are just tweeting each other, show up at Macy's, we're going to do a dying. Some of us, you know, are a little old fashioned, a little old school. We need a little more time. We have got to challenge ourselves. What these young people have done is they have promised themselves and they have promised the world, they have promised the families of the martyred that we are not going to stop until something changes. This is it. If it has to be day after day, whatever, if we have to invade police stations, you know, if, whatever we have to do, they are doing it. Thank goodness. Hallelujah. We haven't seen it in a while. Now let's figure out a way for us to weigh in and help spread this movement and make it even bigger for those folks who for one or another reason haven't had the opportunity to get in it. Thank you. Let me just remind you that uh, fifth, about some 15 years ago, not 15, almost 20 years ago, we had another killing on Staten Island in the person of Ernest Sion. And he was also a Liberian. So we just we're reminded that these things continue to happen and um, it don't just stop until we fight. So, uh, Brother Holmes, I agree with you. Uh, this time, it's, it gives me my, my, a pleasure. It's not, it's not very often you get to introduce your own president. So I have the privilege to introduce somebody that I've worked with for the, over 24 years. Um, she happens to be my aunt-in-law. I'm married to her, uh, her husband's uh, uh, niece. And uh, she's a dynamic woman who's been fighting uh, for what we call Little Liberia in uh, Staten Island and of course the African community. She assumed the presidency of the Liberian community two and a half years ago and her goal was to bring unity to the Liberian community on Staten Island and for some fate and some miracle purpose Ebola has helped her to do that. So sisters and brothers please welcome Mrs. Orita Bessman, yes the president of the Staten Island Liberian Community Association. My heart is heavy As I stand before you, I have to do this bravely because it is not an easy task to undertake at this time, more especially, like we say, our young black men are being murdered like animals. And then in West Africa, we have the enemy that we don't even see killing our people. And then you watch the news and you see asses cutting people heads off and you wonder what is going on around us in the world today. But I start by here to give you a little history and to also encourage us. Like my country national anthem says, in Union Strong, Success is sure. This is the video that I got, our pictures I got from Liberia. That's the after effect of Ebola, where parents had died and left their young children and no one to care for them. And they are eating from the city dump stops, garbages. There's a nurse. She one of the first that contracted the Ebola virus and died and left a three-year-old child in Liberia. And this old man, he was sick. The wife took him to the hospital. They denied his service and he sat in the street and died while sitting there from Ebola. These are the things that are going on in West Africa. People are being treated like animals. If we even respect animals, then we respect people. And human lives do matter. Wow. This is a friend my husband went to college. We are at the Science College. He died from Ebola. 
uh, Mr. Kumaya. And this little boy you're looking at, his parents died, and he was the only survivor of Ebola. He's going home with his certificate in his hands that he's Ebola free. But the community would not accept him, and he one of those not eating from city dumpsters. And there's an old lady standing, sitting begging for food. She's blind. All her children had died. She's in the street begging while people standing in the line waiting for food. And nobody to even look at her or help her to the line to get her food. The mothers, concerned Liberian mothers in the United States got together. And right now, I just come to say, we are all in this together. This is not an African problem. This is not a West African problem. This is a global problem. And if we don't tackle it at its source, it's coming home to us here in the United States. We've seen it when Eric Duncan came to Texas. They, ha they didn't know he had Ebola. Enter the country, even though the news said he knew it. Not a doctor. Help a pregnant woman, like we see the young man sitting there. Hospital denied him service. The wife took him to the uh, pharmacy to ask for help. Pharmacy denied him service. He sat there and died. It was the case with the guy in Texas. He helped a seven months old pregnant woman that was bleeding and crying from stomach pain. All he knew. He helped another human being that was dying. He didn't know she had Ebola. Three days later, he came to America. And the whole world had it that he brought Ebola to America and lied on the phone. And no doctor accepted her to tell him she had Ebola. All he knew was a pregnant woman that died from complication to the pregnancy. So these are the things that happen in West Africa. Our children are hungry. Our people are dying. Our hearts are heavy. On Staten Island alone, one of the ministers lost 16 members of his family to Ebola. People lost 9, 10, 12, 7, 2, 3. The news coming every day. But this is what the, the healthcare workers did in Liberia. In Africa right now, about 20% of the healthcare workers died from Ebola because all they thought they were doing, they were caring for malaria patients, not knowing it was Ebola. <clears throat> so what we started to do on Staten Island is to encourage our Africans, get your flu shots. You don't want to go to a hospital and you are told it's because of Ebola and put you to the side and die from just the common flu and why they treat you like Ebola patient. We've seen it happen in Brooklyn with the lady at the health desk dressing place. Before they got to her, they quarantined the whole place. She had a high attack. She didn't have Ebola. So we try to encourage each and every one of us to even do that. But I come to say, the Staten Island Liberian community right now, we are working on a, a 44 continent of food to send to Liberia. I know my time is up, but this is very sensitive. We're working on a 44 continent to send food to feed the hungry children, the orphans that are the vic victim. And I have volunteered myself to go with the container because I want for those that don't have the way to get to the city to get food to eat. So I'm using myself to go. <laughs> the container is being packed now on Staten Island. We're asking everyone to help us any way you can help us. If you can help to save one person's life, you play your part. So that's what we are doing. I'm going to a library with a container, and I'm going to make sure I reach the remote area, because that's where people are dying the most. The city is free. So I just come to say, we need your help any way you can help us. As for me, I'm already, because of Ebola, I'm out of my job. Since July, I went to Africa and came back. They took me off my schedule. I have not worked because of Ebola. And my job now is embarrassed to call me back because of the shame. So I just come to say thank you to you all, Brother Johnny Stevens, and the committee. We just want to say thank you and all those that left your business schedule on the Tuesday evening to be here. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. 
We are now going to have a little uh, musical interlude. Uh, I'd like to invite Rodney Stone and the Groundbreakers to come up. They've, they've uh, done a song on Ebola. We are the Groundbreakers. Dedication to all the loved ones that are gone, that passed away from this dreadful disease. This song is about Ebola awareness. You know we got to find a way to bring some healing here today. You know we got to find a way to bring some healing here today. Oh. Right. I want you to know and to understand Ebola is death, a plague against man. Divided we fall, united we stand. We must work together to heal the land. There's no time for us to grandstand. We must unite hand in hand, cause people of the world are racing and chasing. Not too sure about what we're facing. Leaders, Leaders of, of the, the world, world must stop lying, while people in Africa are steady dying. The story starts, the way it will end, it's the human race we must defend. Groundbreakers, Groundbreakers came to share information to help educate the world population. Ebola is the total conversation, saving lives is the you final destination. What is this? Another outbreak? How much could we take? Liberia, Guinea, Sierra Leone. It's a death sentence in their home alone. Mother Africa's crying. Ebola tears for being used and abused for so many years. The devil's call back against the wall. A me and more people are likely to fall. Ebola death sentence, find the way out. Teach and preach to what Ebola's about. And I use my pen to open up your eyes on why. All these people have to die. Love and respect. If you hear my voice, I want to save lives. And that's my choice. You got to know the whole world is attached to you. And we can hear you screaming in Africa. Percent of my people are sick, dying, not from a common cold, a fatal disease that we need to control. Doctors, nurses, all being exposed. The fear so dear, schools are being closed, airports and docks soon to follow suit. There's a scare in the air of a Ebola pollute. Chant, we don't wanna die, we don't wanna die. Cause we lose this battle if we turn a blind eye. We don't wanna die, we don't wanna die. We don't wanna die, we don't wanna die. What? We don't wanna die, we don't wanna die. What? We don't want to die, we don't want to die. Oh yeah, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the voices of the Groundbreakers. I'm Rodney C, Cut King, MC Happy. Thank you very much. God bless everybody here. Can we get a hand clap? Can we get a hand clap? We fight against Ebola. It's killing us and taking over. Let's find a cure for it. Pray to get rid of it. We've got to fight against Ebola. We don't want to die. 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 Let's find a cure for it. Thank you very much. Pray to get rid of it. Enjoy your night. We got to fight against Ebola. Shout outs to Peter Wayne, Allison Williams, and Sharon Fabers who helped us put this song together. Next up, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Hillel Cohen. Uh, Hillel is a doctor of public health who specializes in epidemiology. Uh, first, uh, please join me in saluting the heroic health workers of Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and, and the international volunteers of Cuba, the 
uh, from other parts of Africa, the Doctors Without Borders, the Partners in Health, and so many others who are really heroes, who are sacrificing their lives, suffering very large casualties. And some have fallen, some have survived, and others continue. And they have to be not only respected, they have to be honored and treated with the kind of dignity and also given the support that they need because they're fighting for all of us. It's been said several times that to the racist police, the racist courts, the politicians, and the bankers that they work for, that to them, black lives don't matter. And in the same way, to the pharmaceutical companies, the big drug companies, who should have been working on a vaccine, who should have been working on treatments for this virus since 1979, when it was first uncovered, before even AIDS and HIV were, was known, known, Ebola was known, and they did nothing. Because to them, it was a black disease, an African disease, a poor people's disease. And they would rather spend millions and billions for male pattern baldness or for erectile dysfunction or anything else that will bring them profits but they will not spend, whether for malaria or tuberculosis or AIDS or Ebola or what they call tropical diseases, what, but what they mean is poor people's diseases, rural people's diseases, the diseases affecting the peoples of Africa, Latin America, Asia, and they don't give a damn unless they can make profit. Now, until there is a, vi a vaccine and until there is a treatment, the only way to fight this virus, really, is isolation and quarantine. Now, just to separate it, is isolation, nah. isolation means those who are sick and who are already sick and trying to prevent it from spreading. Quarantine are those who might be exposed, who might be sick. But the problem, the problem with the isolation and quarantine, the way it's done now, it's being done as punishment. It's being done out of fear. And what needs to be done is recognizing that the people who have to go into isolation and or into quarantine should be encouraged, rewarded, treated as heroes, just like the healthcare workers, because by doing that, by pulling themselves out, from the population, they are saving all, everyone else's lives. They are sacrificing their well-being in order to save others. And how do you do that? How do you do it both humanely and in the way that people want to do it, not being forced to do it by the police and the army? That's exactly right because they go missing because they're not given the resources. They're not given the money for themselves and their families to take care of them. So they're afraid of quarantine. They're afraid of isolation because no one is providing for them or their families. They're not treated with the respect they need and no one gives a goddamn about what their conditions are. So if we're gonna turn this around if we're going to stop the epidemic until there's a, a vaccine and a treatment, we have to have resources not, as was said, not the 400 beds. That's absurd. There has to be quality, re quality places for the sick where they feel that they're better off than dying at home. And maybe they, right now, many don't feel that way. There have to be quality places, support, for those who, are, who should be in quarantine, but who rightfully are afraid because what's going to happen to them? What's going to happen to their loved ones when they're the breadwinners? We need billions. This is a, a world emergency that needs an emergency response, and we need to demand not this paltry, you know, token stuff, not sending troops 
when you can send doctors and even the troops who are supposed to build resources, they don't need American troops to dig ditches or put up walls. There are lots of African workers who would be willing to do it if you paid them. Send the money and pay them and the materials so they can have the resources. If we want to fight the disease, we, we have to also fight the disease that puts profits ahead of people. And the capitalist imperialist system that puts profit in front of people, that is the disease that underlies all of these diseases and the other diseases that go with it, including racist violence. My papa, my oma, my sister, and my brabby.